So today we have uh, Weyuan from Kiki talking about how to do a Sumpi. So let's welcome Weyuan. Do you want me to stand here? Would that be good for you? Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be sharing about our experience or rather our journey that we undertake in rewriting our monolithic WordPress application uh, into the current backend state that it is today. Okay, uh, just a brief, brief introduction on myself first. My name is Wei Yuan. I'm working uh, as a full stack engineer in Rakuten Viki. Uh, but part of my other role, I also work for, or rather I supervise this development uh, of this project called Archipelago. I'm not sure if you all heard about it. Uh, just to have a show of hands if anybody knows. Oh yes, nice! I'm going to tell Agasu about it. Okay, so yeah, I work for both of these things. If you're interested about uh, Archipelago or Rocket and Vicky, uh, come and find me later. Okay, so let's jump into the topic. Before we talk about uh, how we did the entire rewrite, I think we need to first understand what is Sumpi. Okay, so Sumpi is the largest English based news site that circled around uh, K pop news and K drama. Okay, and the publication itself is. Uh, service through three different mediums. You have your website, Android app, and iOS app. Okay, but this is not just about building one product. It's about building an entire experience for our fans as well. So we conduct events like Sumpi Awards, allowing our fans to vote you know, for the K-pop idols that they love, the dramas that they love. Okay, so let's look at the architecture of how the old Sumpi looked like. So I mentioned about the monolithic structure that the old Sumpi framework was on. So we had the front-end uh, functionalities, the back-end functionality, and the CMS functionality all coupled together in one single portion. Okay, so I believe there might be like this question in your mind right now, which is why is there a need for us to change? Okay, so at the point when we were thinking about the rewrite, we were 20 years into uh, since Sumpi started. So if you're already 20 years in, right, you should have a product that's kind of mature. You have the features that you need uh, for publications or you know, uh, editors to create those articles, readers to read those articles from a website. So why is there this need to rewrite your application? Okay, and there's also the cost that we need to bear. You know, you're looking at rewriting perhaps five to 10 years worth of logic into a new system. You know, why should we have to bear this cost? Okay, so I, earlier on I mentioned about Sumpi, the older framework being a monolith. Okay, the and I have to caution here that monolith, uh, a monolithic app is not necessarily bad for a company. Imagine if you are a startup, you need to you have a small team, you need to get a POC out very quickly. So you use a monolithic app to prototype things very quickly, and this worked for Sumpi in its earlier days. But unfortunately, when you approach a monolithic application in a larger company, you find that it's harder to scale the application. So you have uh, situations like, uh, let's say if you want to develop a new feature for this monolithic app, you first need to uh, write the code for integrating between the backend and the front end of this application. And then you need to do the work for a second time, creating the CRUD endpoints for interfacing with our mobile applications, doing twice the work for one single feature to be achieved. And then there's also other questions that are raised. For example, with a monolithic application, you put your front-end engineers and back-end engineers together on this project. If let's say your front-end engineer writes some feature that breaks the back-end code uh, and alarms are raised, it raises the question, who are you supposed to notify first? The front-end team, the back-end team, or you notify both over utilizing your resources here? Okay, another problem that we face uh, is the human bottleneck. So I would describe that using this thing called the bus factor. Uh, so for some of you who might not know what a bus factor is, to crudely put it, it means that uh, how many times a bus can run over a different member in your team to the point where your project will actually collapse on itself. Okay? So for us, this is a very scary figure. So I'll review to you the figure, which is one. We had one WordPress engineer. And I'm not sure like, you know, if, if you work outside, uh, if you have only one person on one project, if this guy quit or he goes on extended leave, essentially we're screwed. Okay, and then one other thing that we identified is the system bottlenecks of this monolithic application on WordPress. Okay, so over here I have this article published two years ago. Uh, I'm not sure if any of y'all follow K-pop, but this is like uh, this guy Song Joong-gi. He's a very famous 
actor. And basically, when he announced that he was getting married, he broke the hearts of many young girls, and he broke our server as well. So that's the point when we found out that the, our, the maximum capacity of our server was at 8,000 concurrent uh, personnel at any point of time. Okay, and this is with all the optimizations that our WordPress engineer has designed. Okay, so when we face all these problems, we realize that there is a need for us to, you know, relook at our system again, rewrite it so that we can utilize our resources much better. Okay, so let's talk about what we did for the rewrite. Okay, the first thing we need to do is looking at our monolithic application. You know, what are the features that we need to take out for this new uh, application that we want to write for? Okay, so I mentioned earlier on, we have the CMS, the front end uh, features and the back end features. So of course the CMS portion, uh, because the CMS features was used by editors, which was considered negligible uh, compared to the readers of our site. So we decided to maintain our current app uh, monolithic uh, structure for the editors to continue using. Okay? But for our readers, we wanted to write for a new experience for them. So this came out as uh, a different project for our front end team where they uh, rewrite those front end features as a separate application. And then for our project over here, uh, we put, picked out the features that we want to write for this backend service. So for example, things like the read endpoints for article, the CRUD endpoints for users, as well as actions they can perform on a single article. So this formed the basis of uh, moving out from the monolith, creating the service just for the backend alone. Okay. And in deciding the, or rather, in, after deciding the features that we want to write, I think one question that comes to our mind is what language to use. And uh, we have, like, uh, okay, early on in the, the race here, we have two contenders, which is essentially Node versus Go. So, Node, on one hand, it's single threaded, but it's able to overcome some of its flaws by being event driven. But then on the other hand, you have Go, which is compiled. Uh, script so it's supposed to be faster theoretically and it's able to spawn up a lot of lightweight go routines to allow you to tackle a multitude of tasks you know with a better overall latency okay but the truth is this you know i can say this go is better than no no is better than go but there's no way to truly prove it unless if you do a benchmark but the thing is this you know in real life uh where do you get the resources to do this benchmarking i mean it would mean that you need to write a go uh, a service for just using Go, and another service using Node, and then do the comparison. At the end of the experiment, you discard half the work. So not worth it. We have to look at other factors in deciding instead. So the more realistic choice is this. Uh, look at the company itself, see the engineers in the company, uh, what languages they are more comfortable with, and then look at collective wisdom of the group itself. The, we written a lot of Go applications and Node applications, and we found out that Go applications tend to perform our Node applications, uh, outperform the Node applications which tipped us over writing in Go instead. Okay, so now that we have decided the features that we are going to write, as well as the language that we're going to write it in, the next thing we have to look at is system design. You know, how are we going to perform our system design for this new service? Okay, and looking back, our problem over here, you know, this entire conundrum where we did this rewrite was because we had our front end uh, code heavily coupled with the back end code. Okay, and we didn't really want to go into that situation again. So we decided to practice very heavily the separations of concerns. For example, the core application logic should be decoupled from unconcerned things like the uh, protocol. For example, you know, if you write a Rails application, you sometimes take the data immediately from the uh, HTTP request, like get parameters and all that, and that's within your core code. So we wanted to take that logic away from the core controllers, such that in the future, if we were to uh, extend to another protocol like gRPC. We could do that very easily. Okay, and how do we do that? We use a library uh, called GoKit, which allow us to extend uh, to many different protocols at once. Okay, so GoKit itself is sort of fashioned as an adapter for, your, for the request to interact with your core application. Okay, an example on how this is done, I think it's a little bit small, uh, but bear with me. So, when you're using GoKit, you need to do the imports first, get the protocol imports, uh, HTTP transport and gRPC transport. And then over here on the right, I have this uh, method here called make common endpoint. So you can think of this as the controller that we are trying to uh, implement the core application logic. And we can implement that in a HTTP server or a gRPC server. gRPC server, okay, as long as you provide 
the adapter logic, which is the decoding and encoding portions. Okay, so what do I mean by decoding and encoding? It means that your HTTP request, when it comes in, you have your, uh, your query parameters, you have your headers. So you need to pass this information into data that your core logic actually understands. And you do the same thing for gRPC as well. And this same process has to be done for the output, you know, when you pass the data out for the response. Okay, so we sought to do the same thing for our data store layer uh, by impl implanting our own adapters, uh, interfacing between our core logic as well as our data stores, so that we reach a point where perhaps today, you know, we can use Postgres. Tomorrow, we can change our data store to MySQL as long as we uh, change the adapters. And then the day after, you put a cache in front. It doesn't matter. It's the same interface, same methods. And then even then, uh, like moving on from then forward, you can even use third-party API endpoints. For example, today we are using a uh, third-party service called Algolia to help us build our feed functionality. So it, the abstraction is behind these adapters. There's no need to understand whether it's an API endpoint or an actual data store. Okay. So we looked at, uh, so far, the features that we want to write, the language to write it in, and the system design. The next thing that we want to look at is how to solve the issue, like you know, having breaking news like Song Joong-gi getting married, you know, breaking our system. Okay? We have to look at uh, more resilient infrastructure. Okay? So one of the first things that we look at is, with the search of traffic coming into our application, uh, we have to design for things like auto-scaling. Okay? So this is basically under the paradigm of infrastructure as code. You provide some sort of configuration. Uh, this configuration is for this thing called Google Deployment Manager because we are using Google's ecosystem. And within this configuration, you can decide the minimum amount of nodes that you are willing to pay for, as well as the maximum amount of nodes, you know, the total budget that you can put for this single project. Okay? And not just taking care of the search of traffic. I think it's also important to understand that you have to make your application, uh, optimize your application in within, such that you're able to do more with less. So we implemented uh, Fragment Cache using Redis, uh, interfacing between the data store and our application logic, such that you know, when you have search of traffic, the, uh, the content that people are interested in is usually the same thing, it's the same article. So why not have a Fragment Cache, put it in between, and retrieve the same details uh, at a much faster latency? Do I move around too much? <laughs> Okay, so we've looked at things like auto-scaling, uh, you know, being able to deal with the increase in traffic. But what if, you know, we're able to, you know, uh, increase, sort of, okay, meet the traffic, increase in traffic, but we're not able to have a reliable system. Like, for example, in this case over here, you have a single container, you know, where I intentionally bring it down. Can I have the system help us uh, sort of reinstate that automatically? We can do that by using Kubernetes, which is known for container orchestration. Okay, so we use resources like replica sets, which is able to define the minimum amount of, for example, pods that can be alive at any time. So over here, I intentionally brought down a uh, pod, as you see in the first line. So I deployed it over nine days ago. Uh, so you can see it's in, in its terminating state. But then the system realized that, okay, I need to have one pod alive at any time. This is being brought down now. I'm going to automatically, automatically spin up a new pod so that your service is able to function normally. Okay? And beyond automating fixes or scaling for your service, I think one thing that sometimes we overlook is uh, sort of the manual reliability. And by manual, I, do, I don't mean that you should build everything as manual, but rather it's more of the fear of the unknown. You don't know what you don't know. Like, if you don't know what you don't know, there's no way you can build in a fix for something that you have, you're not aware of. So it's always uh, within an imperative to put in monitoring, logging, to ensure that any engineers can jump in at any point of time uh, when there's crisis happening to decide if there's some manual intervention required to reduce the downtime. Okay, and one other thing that we uh, came up with was that, you know, with our old WordPress application, we couldn't have other engineers sort of on board on the project because they couldn't understand all this code that was coupled with each other. And I think this is sort of like a good practice, I think. The, you have to practice the discipline to document your code. And in our case, because we are interfacing, in our case, because we are interfacing with other clients, our front-end clients and our mobile clients, 
So we have to let them know that, okay, as you bring up these new features, you could also look at the documentation and do the features simultaneously with us. So they can also let us know if there's any problems with these endpoints that we are creating. Okay, so what are the end results of this entire rewrite? Okay, so earlier on, we identified that we were having problems because of the entire monolithic structure. And by virtue of selecting the features and rewriting as a separate application, uh, we've now reached a, uh, the situation where our backend service is a system by itself. Okay, so you no longer have the problem where your backend and frontend teams uh, have to congregate you know, on one single code base. They can work on their separate applications. So for example, for our front end, it was rewritten as a single page application, deploy app engine, and it's now uh, communicating with our backend service through a single interface, similar to the mobile clients. So this helps to solve another problem that we mentioned just now, which is doing twice the work for developing a feature. You know, because everybody is using one single interface, which is the CRUD endpoints. Okay, and then another thing is overcoming a human bottleneck. So we mentioned earlier on about the bus factor, of having one single WordPress engineer. Okay, so by choosing a, a common language, a common platform that everyone can, or most engineers could pick up or was already familiar in, uh, we increase our bus factor. Oh. Okay, let me amend that because the screen is a little bit different. It was very different from how I saw it before. Okay. So this one I would say is one of the most interesting parts. By rewriting our application, uh, taking away all the baggage that we had before from the previous monolithic application, the, we're able to achieve the same amount of uh, traffic with lesser amount of resources. So previously, we had seven machines with eight core each. Uh, this was the configuration that we put in to be able to have 8,000 concurrent traffic at any point of time. But right now, we are able to achieve the same with just six VMs and two virtual CPUs. Uh, but of course, this doesn't include the front end. So if we were to add the front end, it's another two uh, VMs with two virtual CPUs each. Okay. And overall, we saw a 56% uh, improvement in latency. Uh, this is just for the back end alone. If we were to include the front end, it's a total of 42% uh, improvement in latency time for fully loaded time for a single uh, browser activity. Okay, so yeah, with that, I've come to the end of this uh, sharing. Uh, if you're interested in finding out more on what we did for this entire rewrite for the backend, you could check out this QR code or this um, shortened link. Yeah, and we did a front end video as well, although the text is a little bit off. I'm gonna change that right now. Uh, okay. Black. No. Okay, I'm just gonna copy the text and see if I can put it here without the link. Keep text. Yes. Okay, something like that. Yeah, if I oops, sorry. Okay, yeah. If I'm interested in uh the rewrite experience for our front end, you could look at the meetup video that we participated in sometime before. Yeah. And yeah, if you are looking to apply to Vicky then there's this link over here.